welcome to the Belmont Journal, your source for hyperlocal Belmont news and community updates. I'm Mike Crowley, your host this week. The town of Belmont has won an award for risk management at the Massachusetts Municipal Association's annual meeting on January 25th. The award was presented to Belmont as a high achiever in risk management for a proactive focus on risk management by town departments. Continuing this focus this year, Belmont plans to pilot a new integrated sensor monitoring system to help prevent and respond to cold weather related breaks in water mains and the town's water system. Last weekend, friends and family of former Belmont Police Chief Richard McLaughlin came together to celebrate and share some of their thoughts about his retirement. Joanna Jubilus was there and gives us some highlights. Thank everybody for joining us in celebrating Chief's retirement. I'm sure that some of you are interested on how retirement has been going. <laughs> well, two days into the official retirement date, I came home from work around three-ish. I was greeted at the door with a smile and I was asked what was for dinner. There's <laughs> no lie. So I smiled back and I said, we need to talk. I no longer have someone who's going to send me a text message at 20 after five on Friday afternoon. <laughs> Asking me, do you have a minute for a phone call? Of course I do. I'm a guy that likes to, you know, use a few sayings here and there, and this one's pretty simple. Um, you you uh, have to give respect to get respect. And Richard McLaughlin is that man. He's the poster boy for the name respect. Richard gives it, and he receives it. And this room is a testimony to that. Everybody was worthy of the chief's time. It didn't matter who you were. When they joked earlier about him wanting to shake hands, if you ever take a walk with the chief, whether it's through the center or at some event, it takes twice as long as you would hope it takes because he has to stop and talk to everyone. I'm not sure how many people in here in this room can say at the end of their career, they have lived their dream. I always wanted to be a police officer from a very young age. And at this point in my life, I can honestly say I have fulfilled my dream of being a police officer and having the opportunity to help people, which I will always be truly grateful for. For that, I just wanna say thank you all again for being here and sharing this evening with us. Thank you and enjoy. Now it's time to dance. Welcome to This Week in the Citizen Herald and Joanna Jubilus, senior multimedia journalist with the Citizen Herald is again with us to talk about Belmont News. Hi Joanna. Hello, Michael. How are you? Wonderful. So let's talk about beer. My favorite topic. <laughs> <laughs> Craft Beer Cellar, a staple in Belmont Center for the past nine years at 51 okay. Leonard Street. They are, this is something I've reported on before, they mm -hmm. are though indeed relocating to the former site of Foodies, which is the basement of 75 Leonard Street. The former Macy's location. The as former well. Macy's location. To give a little history, Macy's closed in 2013, and then Foodies went in there in 2017, so it was vacant for four years. Mm -hmm. But Foodies only stayed open for one year, closed in 2018. So, so here we are, almost two years of that space being vacant. I, I know a lot of people have been wondering what would happen to the space. Right, and these women, these, these owners of Craft Beer Cellar, they have a vision and it's going to come to life. They're going to take over 4,500 square feet of that 15,000 square foot space, which will give them 3,000 additional square foot feet okay. from their current space. So it'll allow them to display their beer a lot better. And they're also going to have wine. And they said they'll even have some food offerings to complement the beer and wine. Okay, so, so at, at this point, we don't know anything yet about what will 
be filling up the rest of the space, right? I cannot publicly report on that at this time. Okay. I think there is a, another lease being negotiated, mm -hmm. and according to Suzanne Shallow, founder of Craft Beer, it will be epic. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's <laughs> let's get an update on the police station yes. construction. I love going on construction tours, if anybody doesn't know that already. And this was my third tour of the police station project since mm -hmm. it started. And it's really exciting to see the progress that they're making. And what's important to know is that the weather has played a very important role in this prog mm -hmm. pro progress. And that's because the weather, as everyone knows, has been mild. You cannot swing steel in inclement weather, according to to the owner's project manager, okay. Tom Gatunas, who gave me the tour. So that is exactly what they're doing. They are swinging steel for the two-story addition that's going on the existing building. The, now this may, this may not be visible from the front if you're just oh, driving yes. by. Oh, no. it's so um, exciting to see. You sh I, I recommend people, if they can, don't go beyond the wire fence, but right. take a peek. It's, mm -hmm. it's amazing. The Sally Port is all framed. This is a 10,000 square foot addition that's costing about $10.6 million, but it is not hitting the taxpayers' bills. It's, there is no debt exclusion required. They were able to do this project without affecting the taxpayers mm -hmm. and it's also saving the town 30 million dollars because a new police station would cost a lot more right and so, and so that that previous well the, the previous plan was to pursue construction of a new police right. station and so right. it's a, just a huge savings project long in the making about about 19 years of trying to get it done so so when are we likely to to see um, the project finished October 2020 Okay, and so that, that's, that's, this year. that's not far away. Right. And I also didn't mention, um, back to craft beer for one minute, um, okay. they, they, they plan to hopefully open in May. That mm -hmm. is their plan. Construction is underway. All right. Well, thank you so much, Joanna. And I know we look forward to both craft beer opening in their new location, as well as the police department um, opening up in, in October or moving to the new, to their Right, moving from their mods, moving, from their moving mods out of the mods to, and back, to, back there. to the police station. I have, I'll have over. a lot more news to report in the near future. All right, thanks so much, Joanna. You're welcome. Okay. The Chenery Middle School introduced a composting pilot last December. The school teamed up with Black Earth Compost, a local company which collects food scraps to help turn those scraps into nutrient-rich soil. Student volunteers, also called trash bashers, have been hard at work to make the new program work. Outgoing principal Mike McAllister spoke with Belmont Journal volunteer Kamako Akai Whitelaw about the program. In December of this year, we started asking students to do something different in the cafeteria, and it was to separate their organic food waste from the rest of their trash putting one in a composting bin and one in a trash can. The reason we did that is because we were seeing that our trash was increasing and increasing and increasing. And what we have to be able to do, all of us, is decrease and decrease and decrease. So last spring at Chenery, we started to have conversations about whether composting was a viable option for us. At the end of the day, we're asking people to do more work. We're asking custodians to do more work. We're asking maintenance to do more work. We're asking students to do more work. And what we decided is we were going to move really slowly in order to get it right. We were aware of Black Earth Composting as a company that's uh, located just a little bit north of here. Um, they were doing curbside uh, composting for the Belmont community as well as a few communities around here. So what they said is if they get new customers, they were able to take some of that money and set it aside for a fund where we could actually uh, bring that into some kind of municipal building. There was a lot of question is, you know, are our middle school students gonna be able to do this? And can, you know, how, what will it take? And are we gonna be able to, to teach them? And what I've learned is that not a lot of kids are coming from homes that are composting, although the good news is I think that's getting higher. Um, but most of them have taken to it pretty easily. You, you watch kids come up really carefully and separate. They pour out their liquids and they put their containers in and then they tip their tray and then they stack their tray. We've been helped by the trash bashers who help arrange that, but I've been impressed. One of the big changes I've seen is just how kids have adjusted to that. So we used to put out anywhere between 12 and 19 bags of trash um, for, a, for an average day of lunch. Um, and now we're putting out about three to six bags of trash. So that's a huge decrease. So they pick up from us th uh, three per day, three large bins of composting food. Uh, it's, mo it's all food scraps. They then bring it to their site and they go through a, a process of actually breaking it down. 
uh, mixing it with other dirts, making sure it, it organically decays appropriately. And at the end, what's the final product? The final product is this amazingly nutrient-rich dirt that they actually then, part of their business model is they then sell that to consumers. It's better than having it all go to like the trash because there's like, it makes methane and that's not good. So if you, it'll like, if you turn it into soil, it can help grow plants, which helps with global warming. My message to future Chinner students is that even if your friends are telling you you're disgusting doing that, you're not. You're do something important and great for the earth, and you can continue to do it, and you don't have to be scared of putting your hand in the trash. So now our hope is that now that they're learning here and they realize that it can be a pretty easy process, when they go to be adults themselves, it'll be a normal process that they've been doing all. Welcome to This Week in the Belmontonian, our weekly segment with Franklin Tucker, editor of the Belmontonian. And you can also see Franklin's work at belmontonian.com. Welcome, Franklin. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? Just fine. Thank you. So um, let's talk about the level of interest in town elections. There isn't any. Okay. <laughs> um, well, we still have a lot. We still have two weeks to go before mm -hmm. the... Uh, before the um, nomination, before your, you have to put in your, uh, submit your papers. So the, fi the filing deadline is February 18th. That's right. But right now, I think we see a very stable um, uh, number of people who are running, uh, basically the incumbents are running for uh, um, uh, the townwide offices. And, and we're seeing a, a, a good level of, uh, of people coming back to the uh, town meeting. There are openings. Uh, precinct six seems, you know, which was, mm -hmm. which is always considered a very active precinct. They have openings, so it's it seems like every it's a, it's very stable. No one's no. There's no real big push to uh, to take out incumbents like we've had in, in years past. When we don't, and I think a lot of that has to do with one of two things. One is that we really don't we we don't have opening we don't have open seats. People are not. Um, uh, retiring from boards and things like that, and I think also maybe it's just the um, uh, we 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 as uh, Americans are being uh, pummeled with politics every so, day, and it's just so, like so perhaps the national is, politics are affecting our local elections, which I I hope that that isn't the case, but. And I think also you just have a very good um, you have boards that are considered very um, competent. Um, they you know there's no one trying to do something crazy. Or pushing an agenda, they really are uh, uh, managers uh, rather than advocates. So it's it's actually very good to see that. But but even in terms of town meeting, um, that you know there are some precincts that that may not have enough people running mm -hmm. uh, for seats. Yeah, that's usually the case. Um, and uh, but there are active um, uh, precincts. Uh, one precinct that has has shifted in many ways is mm -hmm. Precinct Seven, which is on. The um, eastern end of uh, the town, okay. um, the Cambridge border, um, that used to, that used to, because it, it, it is a large number of people who rent, okay. and it's um, and for many years that would be you'd have five six people going for town meeting, you'd have a lot of people uh, just being write-ins who would who uh, who would uh, become town meeting members. Now okay. precinct seven is is now very active, and uh, they have a complete list of uh, candidates. All right, so so. We'll see what happens with the, with the town with the, well. We'll see who files by mm -hmm. February 18th, and um, and the town elections are on April 7th. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's late this year. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I'm stealing myself for an <laughs> update <laughs> on on the the school project. Well, uh, yes, everybody should be excited. Um, uh, Mike Loring, who's a senior project manager for uh, Skanska, um, has uh, gave uh, an update to. Um, the uh, uh, building committee, mm -hmm. and he said that everything is uh, going swimmingly. Uh, so we've we've seen a lot of steel going up. That's right, and 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 the steel that you see is is not the top. You know, right, if you go right now to Concord Avenue and look at that, it's going higher. You know, this is going to be a big building. You know, and it's the first of three wings basically. Uh -huh. And um, what what we were told is that uh, that another crane is coming. We'll have two cranes working together. Um, and uh, once that building has its steel done, that's when he said we're going to see a lot. That's when the activity is just going to take off. We're, we, right, right now, there's fubs, uh, five subcontractors at the building. Okay. In, in a couple of weeks after the steel goes up, we'll have 12. And, it'll, and that's when there's, they will enclose the building. And that's when you'll see uh, just a, a, that's when you're going to say, oh, that's a building. 
And that's just, and right now, what you see the steel, that's just one of three areas that will be built. Okay, Franklin. Well, we'll be talking more, and I'm sure there'll be more news on that project by next week. Thank you very much. Each year, the Belmont High School Performing Arts Company presents a wintertime improv show, and also again at the end of the school year. The Belmont Journal's Roger Colton went to a recent rehearsal where students had to respond on the spot to suggestions from the audience as well as questions. Belmont High School is presenting its annual winter improv showcase. This improv troupe is actually a part of the Belmont High School Performing Arts Company. Uh, and in the show, we have 35 students ranging from freshman to senior putting on the show. Improv is creating a scene or an experience that you make up on the spot um, using audience suggestions and different structures for games. What is something that you would eat at a seafood restaurant? But how you prepare for improv is um, when we're at our rehearsals. Um, some people are up on stage. Um, it can be anywhere from two people to maybe eight people. And um, the rest of the um, improv troupe um, is in the audience sitting. And um, they uh, there's a um, host for one of the games that we're playing. And they ask the audience members um, a question. So from this part of the audience, uh, what is a fruit that you do not like? Kumquat. And you have to, the people up on stage have to create a scene using those suggestions that the audience gives to the host. <laughs> One last, One last. You know, before you, yeah, for just a second, before you eat the kumquat, you like tell my mom. At improv, you kind of learn life lessons, like how to listen to people, how to um, just like build off of each other, um, like build off of ideas that other people have and that kind of stuff and so really that's what I get out of improv and also just have a really fun time. They told me to become one with a lamp to understand how chairs feel. Why are you talking to me? I'm a table. You need to be able to think on your toes. I think self-confidence is huge and that's one of the things that improv has taught me is the ability to jump into situation spontaneously is incredibly important in life and it's what makes you a good improviser. So. <laughs> I smell something. A cane! I smell the cane. You never know what's going to happen. No two improv shows will ever be the same because different suggestions, different games, you know, etc. So I think coming to an improv show gives you you know, sort of a unique kind of show where obviously it does make you laugh, but it's it's something that you wouldn't be able to experience anywhere else. And now it's time for Chet Messer's scoreboard and your local Belmont sports news. Last Saturday, the boys hockey team defeated Woburn 3-2. The first goal was scored by Rocha, and the second was scored by Harrington, and the third a blast from the point by Grace. This was an important win for the ice hockey team, putting them one point away from qualifying for the state tournament. They completed the task of qualification by a 4-2 win over Lexington this past Wednesday night. They now have a record of 9-4-3 in girls ice hockey, they have also qualified for postseason play, winning two out of the last three games. The boys basketball team defeated Reading 45-44 and then upset Catholic Memorial with an 86-84 win. Catholic Memorial was ranked number seven by the Boston Globe and Belmont 16th at the time of this game. Wakefield upset Belmont on Tuesday night, 69-66, complicating Belmont's drive towards the overall Middlesex League championship. It will take three wins in a row to become champions. Marauder girls basketball has qualified for the state tournament by three straight wins over Watertown, Reading, and Wakefield. Belmont came from behind to beat the Reading Raiders. 
key plays were Seller Donligan's steal and driving twisting layup to bring Belmont within two points. Reese Shapajan then hit a three-pointer to put Belmont up by one. A three-pointer by Kiki Cristofori then increased Belmont's lead. Sophia McDevitt made a key foul shot with seven seconds remaining in the game. Redding needed a three-point goal to tie the game. The shot was partially blocked by Sarah Dulligan. Sophia McDevitt was fouled when she caught the loose ball. Demonstrating the coolness of a senior, but only being a freshman, Sophia dropped in two foul shots to preserve Belmont's win. We're introducing a new Belmont community member to do our community calendar, so without further ado, here's Hannah Fisher to tell you all about what's happening in Belmont this week and what you can look forward to. Hello, this is Hannah Fisher with your community calendar. Have you ever wanted to embark on your own epic quest? Here's your chance. The Belmont Public Library is launching a Dungeons & Dragons campaign for teens. Beginners are welcome and dice will be provided. This event takes place on Monday, February 10th from 3 to 5 p.m. in the Flat Room. It's for grades 7 through 12 and advanced registration is required. Visit www.belmontpubliclibrary.net to begin your quest. Who in Belmont isn't troubled by transportation and traffic woes? Join Senator Will Brownsberger for a town hall event on Tuesday, February 11th from 6 to 9 p.m. in the Assembly Room of the Belmont Public Library. In addition to transportation issues, Senator Brownsberger will discuss the upcoming 2020 census process. This Thursday, February 13th, come hear Chenery Band students and their parents and teachers at a once-a-year extravaganza of small symphony groups, followed by the always fun and eagerly anticipated parent-teacher chorus. Don't miss out on this musical experience. It's the most wonderful time of the year. No, not the holidays. It's time for the Foundation for Belmont Education annual fundraiser on March 14th. This year's theme is, drum roll please, Casino Royale, bond with the FBE. It's time to buy your tickets for a fun night of dining, dancing, gaming, and martinis, of course. Visit www.fbe-belmont.org backslash fundraiser to learn more about this event and to purchase tickets. Art historian Doris Birmingham will visit the Beach Street Center on Tuesday, February 11th to give a lecture on portrayals of women in the art of Thomas Eakins, John Singer Sargent, and Winslow Homer. Special attention will be given to Winslow Homer, who was living in Belmont when he created his first light-infused paintings of the American woman out of doors, at work, and play. If you are a New Englander, you must love maple syrup. Now is your chance to learn all about maple sugaring from sap to syrup. On Saturday, February 15th, from 10 to 12.30, join educators from the Habitat Education Center and Wildlife Sanctuary for a morning of getting up close and personal to majestic maples, identifying various species, and tasting sap right from the bucket. To register, visit www.massaudubon.org. That's your community calendar for this week. See you next time. We finish our show with a programming update for your Belmont Media Center channels. Be sure to watch. Well, that's all for this week. I'm Mike Crowley. We thank you for watching the Belmont Journal, and we'll see you next time.